Gallery. It is a pleasure to have you with us today for Unhoused 19. Uh, this is going to be a wonderful discussion, uh, and this discussion is actually in reference or in response to the exhibition that you see all around you in the gallery this month. Uh, it will close on Tuesday. Tuesday will be the last, or sorry, uh, Wednesday will be the last day of the exhibition. Uh, but the show is called Cloudburst, the work of Matt Kenyon. This was a special uh, exhibition that the gallery undertook this year. Um, and if you're not aware, Matt Kenyon is a Baton Rouge born uh, native artist uh, who was born and raised here in Baton Rouge, uh, has gone on to do some wonderful things since leaving. You're not aware, Matt Kenyon is a Baton Rouge called in Buffalo, New York home, uh, but he is a TED fellow. He has been, uh, had his work added to the permanent collection of the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Uh, so this is a really special treat for us to bring this show to Baton Rouge. Um, and today's panel will specifically be a response to one of the works that you see in the front gallery uh, called Lock Set that, is, that deals with housing insecurity. So if you haven't had the chance to go through the show and see everything yet, please take some time uh, before you leave today to, to do exactly that. Uh, I want to say a quick word of thanks to all of our uh, sponsors for this exhibition who made this possible. Uh, first, Mayor President Sharon Weston Groom. I also want to thank Louisiana Travel, Covalent Logic. Dr. Conho, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Louisiana, John G. Turner and Jerry G. Fisher, Debbie Daniel, Entergy, Lynn Petit Pisto, and our partner for more than 30 years at Brown. So please, if you would, a round of applause for our exhibition sponsors. I also want to mention uh, a quick word of thanks for the LSU School of Art, who not only supported this exhibition, but also supported the exhibition catalog. Uh, which are available in the front gallery. If you're interested in getting uh, your hands on one, it is a 52-page document that details every single piece in the show. It also has a statement from Matt Kenyon himself and from Benjamin Hickey, who is the curator at the Hilliard Museum of Art. Uh, so all of that can be found there. And if you're interested in supporting the gallery and its ability to do this very kind of thing we're doing today, uh, the best way to do that is through membership. You can pick up one of these brochures on your way out. Uh, membership starts at $5 a month and go up from there. But it's a great way to support both local artists and uh, a venue that has been home for local artists for more than 50 years. So with that, I'll say thank you again for coming. And I'm going to turn it over to our panelists and to Margaret Hicks. Please, a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, can everyone hear me? Good afternoon. Thank you for sharing your Sunday with us and with the topic I know is near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, something that we spend uh, a lot of our life working on. The panel we, we uh, bring from together, both uh, Housing Louisiana and Together Baton Rouge, Unhoused Number 19. It's a reference to a common tradition in, in the art world to call something entitled to number. Um, but Baton Rouge has the 19th highest eviction rate, uh, or our city has the 19th highest eviction rate of any city in the country. And so what we're experiencing in Baton Rouge has for a long time been a housing crisis, a place where we have housing instability that affects children's ability to have stable education, that affects families' ability to have stable access to their job opportunities. and. It, incredible impact on people's mental health. Um, for those who have been evicted, your rates of mental health issues and even suicide increase drastically. Uh, but we have a lot of housing challenges beyond just eviction, and we're going to talk about several of those here today. 
Um, I'm going to ask everyone to introduce themselves, but before I do, I'll, I'll give a brief introduction of me and my work. Uh, my name is Marley. I work for Mayor uh, President Broom. I have worked in community development in Baton Rouge, where I was born and raised for some time now, and I was recently brought on to Mayor Broom's uh, in her administration to help solve and do some interagency and creative work with partners, city departments, and residents to see if we can solve community revitalization challenges includes housing and light and neighborhoods and place making and all of these things that make Baton Rouge or hopefully one day will make Baton Rouge a community of choice um, and then a place we all want to live and raise our families. So um, I, I'll pass it down for everyone to introduce themselves but I will say that each person here represents a very different sector of the housing ecosystem in Baton Rouge, Louisiana and all are, are fighting in their own ways to make it better for everybody. Um, so I, I work with the city and, and I spend my time looking at how we're spending city dollars and how we're getting creative and how we're keeping our partners accountable and all of that kind of great work. Um, but I'll pass it to Alfredo uh, so he can talk about the opposite end of that. Well, I don't know if I'm making war. Yeah. I'm always trying to make peace and, and maybe connect the dots. Um, I'm Alfredo Cruz. I work with two organizations, Housing Louisiana, which is a statewide network of housing alliances that champion affordable housing for everyone in Louisiana. And I also work with the local housing alliance, Housing First Alliance, um, um, which launched two years ago a process to develop a housing market segmentation study. I'll talk about it. Um, so that's the bulk of my work, but my background is in philanthropy. I worked for 22 years for national and statewide foundations. Actually, I came to Louisiana to help solve the housing crisis. Got a bit distracted with philanthropy for some time, but I've been back in the day. Nice to be here. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Laura Tavall. I'm the director at Southeast Louisiana Legal Services. We're the largest nonprofit legal aid provider, providing pre legal help to low income people in several cases. So you may wonder what I'm doing at this table. It is because um, pre COVID, about 15% of our agency work was dealing with housing issues facing everyday people, evictions, landlord tenant disputes. Um, needing to resolve air property issues for homeowners who had never gone through that legal process when the um, a loved one passes away. Uh, we have three different staff members at the Capital Area Homeless One Stop Clinic who are kind of working on the other end of once folks have already lost their housing or have a history of unstable housing. And then we also do foreclosure prevention work. And along with a lot of other things, but post-COVID, that work is now 32% of our entire caseload. So it has exploded in the wake of the pandemic and then after the pandemic. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Carl Dillon, uh, President and CEO of Urban Restoration Enhancement Corporation, uh, better known as uh, URIC. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, community development organization, and uh, we tackle community development for three pillars. Uh, affordable housing, which of course uh, which is brings you to this panel. Uh, we do that under new construction, uh, acquisition, rehab, and uh, primarily our work has been on uh, the North Baton Rouge uh, area. Uh, we've done uh, single family, so, uh, multi family, uh, rental, and uh, home ownership. Um, second pillar that we have is uh, human development, which is primarily the development programs that we offer. For K 12 after school programs, as well as summer uh, enrichment uh, programs that we offer to the community. And last but certainly not least, is our uh, community engagement and outreach component. Uh, and under that, we offer first time home buyers slash credit repair uh, seminars and also as a resource to the community for any uh, thing that they may need. Uh, for example, 2016 flood, we offered a uh, workshop to the community. Uh, for those that were impacted by the flood, uh, just educating them on the resources that were available to them. Uh, also, uh, preventing certain barriers that people were falling prey to, uh, uh, contractor fraud, uh, how to uh, write up a contract for a contractor, don't give up the money up front, 
different things like that, practical issues, and kind of where I guess we kind of intersect with what Lauren said. A lot of people had those resources that they were had uh, that they qualified for, but didn't have clear title to their home. Uh, so having someone to come out and assist them with that process on a pro bono uh, level. Uh, and more recently, under that umbrella of COVID-19, of course, we offered real assistance to those that were impacted uh, by COVID-19. So just being a resource to the community, uh, and that's what we do here at you. Hey y'all, um, I'm Rachel Sanderson and I'm just really glad to be here today. I would say I'm probably the, the most non-traditional housing person at this table. Um, and I say that because I'm the director of planning and capital region planning commission and we are the metropolitan planning organization as well as the planning development district and we are also the uh, coordinator for region seven of Louisiana watershed Ventures. So the perspective that I've been taking um, in my background and experience, I went to Alfredo, came through philanthropy, worked at a state agency, Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, and then landed in this role and have been really trying to think about um, several different things. Let's say, I think a more holistic approach to how we adapt to climate change in particular. And I think one of the biggest sectors for that is housing. So how do we really think about what more resilient, affordable housing looks like? Um, how are we thinking about insurance over time and whether places are still insurable, uh, first of all, and then if people can actually afford their insurance? Um, and making sure that people are in homes that are actually also safe from that other perspective. Um, you know, then I think the last two weeks alone, we've had six pretty significant rainfall events across the United States that have resulted in significant flooding, uh, not to mention the heat waves across Europe. And it's the impacts of climate change are, are real and we're experiencing them. And Louisiana is extraordinarily vulnerable. We think about population migration, uh, both just as a result of different um, life decisions that people make. And so Dr. Thomas Douthat is in the audience here. He's on one of those projects where we're uh, exploring population migration, the data center is leading that. Also working with Dr. Rebecca De Jesus Crespo, who's sitting next to Tom, um, on another project where we're working also with Bill VR and other partners on looking at vacant, abandoned, uh, deteriorated properties of bad databases in tandem with the most recent modeling from the stormwater master plan that EBR just did to actually say, okay, where are there some opportunity areas for rebuilding things? Like where does it make sense to reinvest in community based on a flood risk perspective, thinking longer term about climate? And then where are some places where we might want to consider actually using this for green infrastructure or um, detention retention purposes that's for the more whole of the community to help reduce flood risk? Um, we've also worked on a project with Georgetown Climate Center as a partner along with a local working group to be able to put together what we call growing resilience at home. Um, and that's actually a national toolkit that is first and foremost to the benefit of the greater Baton Rouge area uh, that actually lays out for policy and decision makers different ways that you can enact certain policies or programs to be able to think about things like Brazilian affordable housing and nature-based solutions. Um, and I know that several folks at this table have also <laughs> contributed to that. So, um, you know, we're also about connecting the dots between local and national work and uh, just trying to get things moving forward so that we can stay here as long as we can and have it be safe for everybody who lives here. So just glad to be here today. Okay. <laughs> um, I wonder if y'all can hear us without this, but uh, thank you. Uh, as you can see, there are a lot of different experts on this issue. We can kind of come at this from different angles, which I, which I hope will lead to a really organic conversation between all of us. And, I'm not going to be waiting for me to ask a bunch of questions. Um, so the first question I I want to ask here today uh, is so the the art exhibit itself is is really moving for this. We haven't really gotten to, but particularly the one with the housing and the water and the and the champagne glasses of celebration. So. Climate change is going to affect our our housing portfolios. We are all dealing with issues because of the last I mean, large crisis of the pandemic has affected eviction rates which are now soaring it's affected you know housing cost prices inflation and construction i'm sure is absolutely wild but as we as we so first my question is, is what are you doing to help uh, to address the challenges around housing that have been because of COVID 19 and then also what is the long-term strategies for how we address flooding, and resiliency needs, and how we're responding to the current crisis of 
first. You can ask them whomever you want. So I guess the you know the reason I came here, I, I have to explain that part um, because it, it, it explains a lot of what I'm, why I'm still here and doing what I'm doing. It's like I'm I'm from a country in Nicaragua that's surrounded by water, and it's also tremendously impacted by climate change and has been since I was a kid. You know, the 19, um, the 1971 earthquake, I was a child, that destroyed Managua and caused my family to move to the uh, countryside. Um, you know, it was part of that shift, that climate change that started many years ago and continues. And I mean, I've gone back to Nicaragua recently last four years and see where you know they've started building subdivisions that are now underwater literally the ocean has moved into places where you know developers started building communities for, for um mainly americans that are looking for cheap places to retire to buy property and that went really literally underwater right? um, and when i saw that i realized you know there's a lot to work to do here in to help plan for that kind of change. And so when I finished my graduate work in urban planning for developing countries, I started looking for a place where I could work to practice that. And Louisiana was that place because it was both impacted by Katrina at the time, this is 2011 when I moved here. But also a lot of the quality of life indicators here are very similar to a third world country. You know, poverty rates, infant mortality, you know, a lot of those things. Sadly, but it's true. And so I thought this was a great place for me to practice what exactly what I wanted to do in the know. And you know, nothing's gotten better, things have gotten worse. And so what I spend my time doing now is just really trying to connect resources that exist. That's because I've worked in philanthropy most of my career. I know that money's not an issue, that money exists to solve for a lot of these problems. It's just connecting the resources to the root causes. You know, and we, we continue to connect resources to all these side effects that don't get to the root causes. You know, and, and, and I, I, I give you, for example, the most recent emerging rental assistance program, you know, which we're, we're starting to learn across the entire country what a big flop that was, realistically, because it was a banded approach. It never really solved the core reasons why people were falling behind in rent. You know, it just paid for arrears, but it didn't solve for the core cost, nor did it provide a lot of support services family needed. So, you know, I spent a lot of my time to help solve for this, connecting the dots, connecting resources to um, solutions that could address the root causes of poverty and circumstances um, of low-income families to help solve for their housing stability. Um, and at the same time, paying attention to the, the increase in problem because of the migration of people who are being displaced because of our sea level rise and the impact that's happening in the coast. The moderator will take one for this. I did want to say something about that, and then I, then I do want to hear about your COVID-19 response um, and, it's, and our long-term climate strategy. So emergency rental assistance is a national program, and, and we have one here. Founders actually got more dollars to low-income residents faster than pretty much any city. So it's actually on some level quite successful. But I do think nationally they are looking at that program. And future emergency rental assistance dollars are going to have a lot more flexibility in how we actually look at, at those root causes. And the root cause, right, your Housing First Alliance rep here, have addressing people's housing enables them to address all of the other poverty issues that affect that face their life. You, you cannot get a quality education if you do not have somewhere to live. You cannot address your social emotional learning, your mental health, 
you cannot get a job, you, you can't get out of a system that's causing you to be impacted by crime and, and violence if you do not have a stable place to live and from which to grow and achieve your personal goals. And so, um, you know, that housing first approach is incredibly important to Mayor President Broom, incredibly important to our office, and, and we're excited to work with partners like you to, to see how we can do that better um, and, and be more forward thinking. But yes, back to COVID. <laughs> And I believe you received some of those emergency rental assistance dollars too. We did. <laughs> um, so our organization actually provides legal services in 22 parishes in Southeast Louisiana. And our two biggest areas that we work in are New Orleans and Baton Rouge, although we cover a lot of those parishes. And um, just to give you an idea of I can't tell you exactly what the eviction rate was, but we did compare our pre-COVID requests for people calling us for legal help and landlord-tenant disputes and eviction cases. And um, in New Orleans, it was about 300% more uh, there. But in Baton Rouge, it was a whopping 1,461% which is incredible. Yes, I did triple check the numbers before I said them. 1,461%. Um, and um, I think part of it is, um, you know, somewhat, somewhat we are sometimes a little bit of a best kept secret. A lot of folks don't realize that they can access legal assistance. And so when agencies started coming together, the mayor's office, the ERAP programs, and we started getting embedded, then folks realized I should call for, I, I can call for legal help. Um, and the state of, when we get to root causes, um, it's very difficult to successfully stop evictions when you're fighting using Louisiana landlord tenant law. But that is what we have. <laughs> Um, Louisiana has some of the weakest tenant protections in the United States um, and as compared to some other states. And I won't go through all of them, and, you know, because we have a lot of other people. And we have had some improvements, you know, micro, micro steps, um, but like, for example, I'll just give you one, one example. In most states, if you fall behind on your rent, um, you get like an opportunity to fix it. Let me just pay my rent. Something happened, I got behind, pandemic or not, and I'm gonna scramble and I'm gonna get the rent together, whether it's myself or borrowing it or getting it from ERAP. But in Louisiana, if a landlord has decided, nope, I don't wanna take it, they do not have to. Um, and so you, you know, that's just one of a myriad of examples. So, um, one thing about the pandemic in some ways, um, I would never call it a silver lining, but a lot of folks who didn't really realize how bad the crisis was, woke up um, and I think started to uh, kind of connect the dots, which we've all said several times about how do we get folks to resources uh, landlords became, in many instances, more willing to work with folks because, let's face it, they were hurting also. Um, the pandemic was affecting everybody. Um, in New Orleans, I'll mention one other thing that we we really would like to see is sort of, a, we'd like to see it happen here in Baton Rouge, and we're, we're just beginning to open the door to this. But we started an eviction uh, diversion project which is what we call it, where basically we just put attorneys in the courthouse. So when you, you know, civil cases, unlike criminal, you do not have a right to an attorney. Um, if one is available through legal aid or pro bono, you may be able to get assistance. But with, um, in New Orleans, we were successful in, in working with our local court system to handle evictions. We just went over there and said, hey, we want to start a debt table like this, but we didn't even have a table block at the time. Um, and we started the day after Mardi Gras in 2021. And we were just there. Um, and a lot of folks ended up seeking services right there on the spot, and their case was like in five minutes. 
And over time, um, we had a really good success rate with either working something out or payment plans or connecting with the ERAP um, or just getting folks some additional time depending upon what the situation was. And when we first started the project, there was about a 50% rate of people, tenants, not even showing up to court. And it's been cut down by 20%. So we still have about a third of people that don't even come. And I can't say that it's hooked up over there or anything like that necessarily, but the court took some proactive steps to inform people of services. Uh, they started texting people information uh, and a lot of other things. So we're hoping to start a similar project. I don't know if you know this, but we just got permission from that Rouge City Court to, to start a pilot where we're gonna be trying to do something similar. So those are some of the some of the things we did and are still doing. So UREC was a part of that same uh, team that Laura was uh, talking about, the ERAP uh, program. Uh, and it was really an all hands on deck uh, type of uh, project um, where the federal government gave these funds for emergency room assistance. And uh, there were community partners. We were one out of five or six of those community partners that were basically those that applied were following up with those tenants, uh, verifying their uh, arrears, uh, getting all the necessary documentation that we needed for uh, auditing purposes. And then a part of their process was following up with the landlord just to sign a landlord tenant agreement that they had. And this was basically saying that, hey, verifying that this is the amount of funds that uh, they are in arrears and uh, Pretty much signing a promise that they would not evict within the 90 days uh, of uh, receiving those funds. Uh, so uh, we, we we were a part of that in uh, doing that process. You did have some landlords, not many, that just said that they didn't want to sign off on it. So they either it was a tenant agreement that we could sign off on, or if they were going to proceed the eviction after the uh, government mandate had expired then we would help them to identify some other housing where we would also uh, provide them more assistance uh, at, a, at a new place or a new location. Uh, so very needed at that time. Like Laura said, I don't think we realized just that, that how great the need was, uh, but we were glad to be a part of it. I think, Marley, do you have another question added to that that I probably could add some context to? Yeah, as far so, as the climate change? Yeah, so we're responding to COVID-19 still, right? I mean, yep. you're still seeing huge sh shifts in people's housing. But we have a, an impending, another crisis down the line, and that is climate. And so how are we using this response to COVID-19? How are we remembering that long-term yep. crisis that's coming for us? And how are we using the dollars that are coming to us today to prepare for that? Sure. So, and, I, and I'll talk about that from my development uh, perspective. Uh, cost have skyrocket uh, out of the roof lumber uh i'm told it's going down but it's still not pre-pandemic uh levels uh so just construction costs has dramatically increased and of course what happens when construction costs increase that's when rents increase that's when home prices increase so uh those costs are in somewhat in a way passed down so we are trying to uh the good thing about that is that some of these programs, federal programs that fund housing development, they are aware of those and have kind of raised some of those limits that they had in place, which has kind of helped us where we don't have to pass the buck, so to speak, to the uh, tenants and homeowners. Uh, one thing that we do and we've done in the past with all of our projects, of course, the insurance has, has increased dramatically as well. We try to identify projects that are not in a flood zone. Um, and that's just so that that can be an added cost where we're making housing affordable to those that we are renting to or to those that we are uh, home ownership uh, for. Uh, a second thing that we do is, and, and, and I, we've been hit by storms by storms. Uh, you know, we're right in the, uh, was it Ida, Laura, a lot of hurricanes that we've had in the past five or so years. So how do you build uh, housing they can be sustainable in these areas. So trying to identify certain things that we can add, whether it's a, a different here in the AC unit, energy efficient appliances, uh, different shutters that we can add to those uh, our developments that can kind of 
help sustain some of the uh, natural disasters that we do have. And one thing that we try to do when we do this is try to keep in mind the uh, maintenance and the upkeep of those things that we're adding to our development. So we're not adding, and I don't want to <laughs> pick on people, but after, I think it was Hurricane Katrina, you had someone that built these lavish, uh, this lavish development, very sustainable, uh, oh, and I, sh I shouldn't say stable, but green housing, energy efficient, but when it came to do maintenance on these different projects, the, the maintenance work was just out of the roof. So, you know what I'm saying, trying to uh, identify things that may not uh, be a burden on people when it comes to doing preventative maintenance is something that we're looking to take into consideration as well. I don't know if it's appropriate to ask a question, but I have a question. So, does you is it like the housing authority and that it's it's building property and then renting it to people or I don't understand like you said you're tell me I I don't understand but tell me how y'all have the people tell me what sure you so we're a nonprofit developer okay. so you, you know yeah you, you have for profit developers that they'll uh, uh, develop a, a property and rent it or um, sell it to, to a potential buyer we're a nonprofit and we're doing it on the affordable side. So you're not a government entity, we're just not. a nonprofit agency that's just, okay. Sure. Right. And we do receive federal funds uh, in order to to, uh, to do the projects that we have. But you apply. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Along with that. Yeah. yeah. So I think whenever I was thinking a little bit about the connection, so Full disclosure, my agency doesn't necessarily do anything with COVID-19 response. It's just, it's not our wheelhouse for regional government. So it's just, it hasn't been our place. But um, whenever I was really thinking about the connection between climate and COVID, I think there's an obvious thing where it was whenever, when everybody started saying, how oh, more greenhouse gas emissions reduced, et cetera, et cetera. But I was actually thinking a lot about the 2020 storm season um, and just 2020 in general, whatever it was, I think everybody kind of recognized this new space of safety where they could be at home. So you either recognize that your house was a really safe place to be in for a long time, for weeks, months at a time, or you recognize that it wasn't. And the gratitude that I had in that moment, and then I think with 2020, uh, coming into the storm season, really questioning that again, especially when we were at the peak of, of the pandemic with these more... Um, you know, I, I would say variants that had a lot more severe long-term implications for folks. Um, and just really thinking about, okay, what does it look like to evacuate to somebody's different place or shelter, et cetera, et cetera, while a pandemic exists? And then I don't think that I fully understood what safety in my housing meant until Ida last year. I live in Hammond and I was out of my house and we were very, very, very privileged. But I was out of my house for almost three weeks. We didn't have power for two weeks and on the internet for 40 days and have drinking water for two weeks. Um, and just, I think like the amount of gratitude that I felt for having the privilege of access to safe housing, for being able to come back to my house. Um, for me, I think like that's, that's one of the connections I'm making with COVID-19 in particular. Um, in that experience. And, and there's still people who aren't back in their house. And so I just think about that and what that looks like. Some of those people are people who live on my street, right? They've been out of their houses for a while. And those are people with access to resources, access to insurance, um, et cetera, et cetera. Like, and, and I know that down by you, especially, things are really hard. People left and they're not coming back. That happened after Ida. I think Lake Charles, there's still 2,000 unoccupied homes. That's a lot of people that just left. We saw that in Katrina. We see that after every single storm. Um, and some of those people actually live in my neighborhood because they left after Katrina and they moved to the North Shore. And so it's, it's, that's just what's on my mind. But I think too, in the in the longer term, and thinking about the resourcing that we have, I think I think the way that we spend our resources is only as good as the policies and codes that we have to enforce and make good on that public investment. And so whenever I think about these long-term challenges, I also think a lot about, okay, what can we do on the, in our existing codes and ordinances? That makes sense. Like you mentioned not building that affordable housing in the floodplain, right? Like that should not be something that's even an option. Like why would we ever build affordable housing in the floodplain? Um, the, the burden that individuals face, whether that's from a, a multifamily unit after they flood or an individual um, situation where, for example, in Slidell, um, person who 
Mine's the same thing East Habitat for Humanity has several Habitat for Humanity homes that have mostly been um, sold to low-income African-American families. And those same homes are now in a program through the state's Office of Community Development to be acquired because they're in such a high flutterist area, right? And then that also begs the question of a levy that less than six miles away is building is being uh, currently finished around an African white community it's in the same jurisdiction. And so I think there's a lot of questions that we have to ask ourselves about the way that we spend our money, who we spend our money on, and then the different codes and ordinances that we have to be able to say where we build, what we build, how we build. Um, and I think that goes along too with these different building standards. So you know, we saw that homes that were built after Katrina did really well, and Ida and Laura, all the storms after, and that's because you know, our building code council actually adopted more stringent codes, which was really great. Um, but we also see that same building code council struggle with adopting a foot of free board, which is something that's pretty uh, pretty standard, actually. There's something through the National Flood Insurance Program called the Community Rating System. We have communities ranked from class 10 to class uh, zero, I think, is the highest score. So the lower the number, the better your score is. And the better your score is, the larger the in the reduction that you see in flood insurance payments for your community. And so in order for you to get class eight or higher, you have to have a foot of free board adopted. And so that's a very large political hurdle in a lot of communities across Louisiana. And so adopting it actually as a code within the state gives the opportunity for a lot more jurisdictions to be able to participate and be a higher class getting flood insurance reductions for details. Is it okay if I take? I just want to know what a foot of free board means. So you keep saying that like we yeah, all Yeah, no great question. <laughs> so basically, whenever you build something and um, you're thinking about the amount, like the flood depth of water that you'll have. So let's say it's like 10 feet. If you have a foot of free board, you just build a foot above that. And so it's like, yeah, so if you have a 100 year floodplain, which is a 1% chance of happening, in a given year, and it's 10 feet, you'd build to 11 instead because we know that chances are it could it could flood more than 10 feet. So yeah, and there's some communities that have two feet as well. It's a good clarifying question. So how do we address the situations where, um, because of climate change and because also um, corporate building of structures that build higher than people who have um, legacy plans? are not flooding when they never flooded before. So then they get classified as being a flood zone when they have never flooded before. And that's their inheritance. So that's their property that they own, which is affordable because it's already paid for. And then now your premiums go up because you have now been declassified or classified as a flood zone. Another great question. And um, you know, unfortunately, and it's, it's unsatisfying. I don't think we have an answer to that, to be honest. I mean, and, and when you're talking about folks that are building up higher, that that's also a land use policy decision. So when we talk about um, fill mitigation or fill mitigation or building on fill, um, that's just people bringing in a bunch of dirt and then yeah. building their house on top of it. And then that's the situation that you're talking about, right? So you can write that into your ordinance where you you can't have fill, you can't build on fill. You have to be able to build a pier and beam structure. So you build your house on stilts essentially, which there are a lot of different ways for that to look really nice. but that legacy question, I think, is one that people are really thinking about in the long term because the other issue is, is the government comes in and they say, hey, we'll buy you out. And you're like, great, a flooded six times. It's, that sounds great. And then you're like, but wait, why are you giving me less money than what I pay for this house? And I think right now it's the, the only type of programs that I've heard about that um, try to help bridge that gap. Like I know our state's Office of Community Development is allowed through CDPG Mitigation Community Development Block Grant mitigation funds to provide additional funds to kind of like have that but my understanding is it's still not the it's still not the same and i think too the other um conversation that comes up is around you know the the legacy of racial segregation and how black and indigenous persons of color well income communities have historically lived in places that are more vulnerable and so then it's, you, know, you give somebody less for their house it's also a community that's seen extreme divestment over time and so you're just compounding essentially this issue of, of this racial inequality gap that exists with the communities. And so um, it's a good question. I, I think that's open. So with issues like sense. that, it's, it just seems always like a common sense answer, which I agree with you when you first said it. Just means it doesn't make any sense 
to build a house that is in a classified flood zone. But why is that true when we know what you just talked about? Why wouldn't you provide a house that's built above the standard in a classified flood zone, but you would put it at a level that would not flood? Maybe the area would flood, but the house would not. So why isn't that part of the discussion? It just seems so easy to say, oh, we're not going to build a house in a flood zone. Okay, but then who are you serving? Well, that's, that's what free board is. So that's what the free board but is. But they don't the yeah. give you that if it's already classified. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're not going to provide housing if it's already classified as flood. I mean, but we've already got houses in this neighborhood near us that they were pure and bean, and they got torn down and got rebuilt on filling with slab. So, that's, so there's a, that's con there's a contradiction. Here, and that just happened. So that I think that's a, <laughs> if we're going to let that happen, like, I mean, you know what I mean? I, I feel like you probably agree with this, so I don't want to, like, give a yell at you about it, but, like, no, no, I think no, that's no. something it's actively happening now. Yeah, I don't know if my question is just about. I can help out here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'll, uh, as a city rep, I'll, I'll try and take the, it's my job you. to take the list. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think to your point, I'm, I'm sure you would also love to see some differences there. I, I'll talk about the policy conversation here in Baton Rouge uh, with some of this COVID-19 money, actually. The this, this city paid for this really large stormwater master plan that didn't just plan out try to answer some of these questions for our local community but has been i mean tons of debris has been removed from our stores i don't know if you've noticed it's been raining every single day mm -hmm. and we've not seen this i mean just to pat the metaphorical city on the back um so I mean, we, we've done a lot of that with our COVID 19 money and we're looking at the projects we need to do to make this city more resilient of uh, the third the fourth piece of that where we've got planning work and, and then we've got the dredging and we've got the projects. The policy piece of that has been um, the most perhaps critical, but also has posed as was expected challenges. Right, because everything we're talking about deals at the same time that we have a housing crunch, we don't have enough housing to meet the needs. We are a receiving community. We have our own climate issue. We are receiving community for housing. The cost of housing is going up. We don't have enough of it. And somebody wants to come and tell you we want to make it even more difficult, even more expensive, and even more time consuming to add housing stocks when we need it so desperately because of all the issues we've talked about. So this is just a negotiation between people who've been in a community a long time, between black and brown communities, between, between people who need new housing as their family grows. So this is a, a crux of, of a lot of challenges and issues and opinions and experiences and values that makes us a little bit more difficult than it would appear on the surface, which is just smart planning policy that makes us more resilient. But we are negotiating with this. We are, our stormwater team is, um, they themselves are really strong advocates for, for strong policies in this, and they are negotiating at the table with some of the developers who will then have to execute on these policies and be responsible to the permitting office to be more resilient with their construction. And so this debate is happening. And I'm excited to see what comes out of this from our Department of Transportation and, and everyone else who's been a part of that process. Does that help? Did I miss, you know, and any, any additional questions about that, I'm happy to answer. I just want to throw something else in the mix. Not, not to add, to you know how difficult a question this is between planning and reality and then dealing with people that have needs. Um, and one of the things um, we saw this over and over with you know Katrina and then Rita and Gustav and Ike and Isaac and Laura and Delta and Zeta and uh, Ida and whatever else. I mean, there's there's been a lot. And, um, you know, when the rebuilding comes in, um, certainly those issues around racial inequities and, you know, how much things cost and, and 
lower value neighborhoods and how much more costs are rebuilt and all those things come up. But another thing that we've seen quite a bit of um, is folks that are seniors or people living with disabilities. The higher you build, it's really hard to accommodate the needs of like our aging population and our population with special needs. Um, you know, we serve the Homa area too. And, you know, you see these houses in Jefferson Parish, Lower Jefferson, and you'll see houses, you know, 12 feet up, 16 feet up. Um, and when that little bitty elevator like thing breaks, they are stuck. Um, and so, you know, it's really tricky. I mean, any solution you get, there's always challenges. But I do think, you know, from a planning perspective, perspective, knowing that we have this aging population also, you know, really kind of throws another wrench in the plans of what's already extremely complicated. Yeah. And I, even, I want to throw out to Carl real quick. We talked about not allowing affordable housing and floodplains. I mean, that feels really common sense because you can talk about how challenging it is to find empty land that's not in a floodplain. It is. I mean, I, I think right now it's just difficult to find find a plan, period. So when you add that layer to it, yeah, by all means, yes, it is very difficult to, uh, to find it. But I think it is a benefit to someone that's purchasing a home. We work with them, like I said, we do outreach. As far as uh, home buyer and credit repair seminar, you have some people that may take a year to get their credit to where it needs to be. And their flood insurance policy on top of that layer, you know what I'm saying, can make a difference in them qualifying for a mortgage or them not qualifying for a mortgage. Yeah. Well, can I say something about this? Sure. So the, the negotiation you're talking about, you know, I think there are a lot of people living in poverty that are left out. They're not at the table to negotiate what they need. And <clears throat> what's necessary for us is to consider the land that we do have, it's restricted on how, how much density can go on. And, and I think that's one of the things that has to be addressed. You know, um, we see like in New Orleans, they try to do these accessible dwelling units, you know, small cottages to be built onto other houses. Um, we see that here in um, in the garden district. You know, a lot of those houses have like a little dwelling unit on the back that could be rented a lot of times to students. And we have a lot of neighborhoods that have big lots. And so we have a lot of land. We just have to, in that negotiation you're talking about, make sure that, you know, low income families and individuals that don't need three bedroom houses that use a small cottage, that we can build those kinds of you know units in places where there is land that is safe and that is accessible to jobs, to a lot of the services that folks need, to amenities, but it's not in a poor neighborhood, in a poor area. I mean, density is a um, is a real challenge, though. I think you know, probably many of us live in single family neighborhoods and, and feel value in that. And so, changing that that way of life for many people to say, that, how many of us want a duplex? I mean, how many of us want a single family home to be torn down next to us and a duplex to be put up? I think that these are the top challenges and questions we need to start asking ourselves as we look towards. What does density and resiliency and affordability look like in our housing stock? Um, and I, back to your point, I don't think we have an answer on this. So, this, oh, well, Ms. Pammy had a hand raised. Mm -hmm. I was going to suggest when Ms. Tuttle was talking that how many of you remember the pattern books that all came out after Katrina? Mississippi was the first one to get one out. That news, Brad Hunter wrote it, and their pattern book. I still have it in my book. The reason that it's important, though, is people who develop those pattern books as well. How, how, I mean, it was a reaction to how are we going to recover? Look at what all has been destroyed. Mm -hmm. And people were very imaginative because we have lost so much. Anything was on the table, right? But we didn't really ever follow too many pattern Again, I look at mine every once in a while. 
things for climate resiliency like building roofs more than just two feet out to create more shade. Building porches that were not on the side where the sun came. But even more interesting was in Vermilion Parish and in Cameron Parish, why would you build, and of course, down to your concern about elevators, but they had plans for um, homes were built, yeah, they weren't all 4,000 square feet. They were probably going to find homes, Jennifer, and I've been interested in. But they were all raised with walkways and trees, and there were lifts and stairs and elevators. And you walked along the walkway, you got to your homes. That's all common sense issues right there. I mean, in the pattern books, there's some ideas we need to be using now, but we didn't use them then because we weren't as desperate. Is there an issue with follow-up mm -hmm. With what? Complacency, an issue with follow-up, but we're not following through on the ideas that exist. Well, I think there's also some challenges with choice. Yeah. People want to live in the homes that were replicated where their grandparents lived. There are we a lot have of empty houses house. in Baton Rouge that have been empty yeah. for a long time and nobody's doing anything with them. We have a lot of people who don't have a house to live in. Yeah. To make that connection and to be able to develop these houses. But I was talking to somebody that they inherited a number of homes in the Baton Rouge area. There was a law that said that they couldn't rent or lease the houses without uh, remediating the asbestos. And she said, you know, I'm not going to take a part of that. I, they're trying to force me to do something that I didn't want to do. These houses are going to stay empty. The obstinance in that concept cost her money, but she was okay with that. And why couldn't we shape laws and regulations to say that if you're not going to develop this property, then we're going to take it into a consideration for developing it in our own terms? It's so one thing I, I will say to, to have compassion, not particularly for that individual, but in general for those who are maintaining aging housing stock in our city, there are a lot of people who've inherited properties. It is incredibly difficult in this country to finance rehab. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you have tried to do that. Um, if you are trying to rehab under $50,000, chances are you're paying it out of pocket in this country. Mm -hmm. Stats show us that. So how many of us are sitting around $50,000? I, I mean, I work. I work for the government, so I don't have that. So, and and I and I am still, you know, significantly more financially secure than many of the people, and many of the people who whose homes are in these photographs. So, to have empathy for the aging homes you see and, and why they're not why they're sitting empty or why no one's doing anything with them, sometimes it's financing. Mm -hmm. But in other, but sometimes it's not, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes they're not owned by an individual who's struggling, and they're owned by other entities. And so there are examples in other cities where you, property taxes are levied based off the value of home. You let it sit in disrepute and actually it's capital gains right off. There are policies that switch that and that if you leave something vacant it actually costs you. And so there are ways and recommendations that could be looked at. I don't know if we're looking at that holistically, but I do want to pass this to Alfredo to talk about um oh yes I'm sorry. that's okay. I know you seem so passionate about okay. it. Sorry. <laughs> Because um, I do want this to be a moment, right? We we are housing sometimes can feel like this thing that somebody is doing. It's it's I think people talk about education for making, but actually, of all the social issues, in some way, every single person is touched by housing, and all of us have opinions about it, whether or not we know it or not. Um, and all of us are contributing to the framework of our housing challenges and solutions. So, um, actually, Marley, it, like it's right there. It's like right there. Like we're talking about the blight. I think that's actually deeply intertwined with this. I live before I moved back here ten years ago. I lived in Montgomery County, Maryland, and I can tell you right now, property doesn't sit undeveloped because the the taxes on you if you did that like would be you would mm -hmm. sell that property so fast. Like I culturally though. We don't want to pay taxes here so we have very low taxes and so there's not a lot of teeth even if you know exactly how you would play we got the pattern books we got we have like no people are just gonna give them choice right and the choices are made in the context of like there's no pain there's no pain that you do exactly what you're describing so there are of course there are other places do it we just don't 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that, and I really won't talk about these other people talk. Because property tax is another city government issue. Um, some of this seems to continue to roll back to the city government. Um, property taxes are not only not incredibly high here, homestead exemption, which by the way affects quality of our services. Um, they're not very enforceable. Uh, you know, if you don't pay your property taxes in the city of Baton Rouge, I, I hate to even share this information with now, we will all want to go and pay them. Um, but we can't take your property from you if you don't pay them. Um, they will sit in a fun legal limbo called adjudication, you may have heard this term, which basically means they sit with a debt, and it's the same debt like you don't property pay your internet bill. If you don't pay your internet bill, cops cannot foreclose on your home, and they will sit there with that debt, and if there's no creditor, creditor can come and bother you about it. And then eventually, in several, several years, if you never pay off that debt, that they can try and get a judge to file a lien that will give them cloudy title, which makes it incredibly difficult to redevelop. And I'm sure you work on those properties all the time. But that can take 10 or more years. Um, so it's, it's not even just about the cost of our taxes, which matter for a host of issues, but it's also our ability to take some of the abandon airship properties with 50 heirs and none of them live here and none of them know they own a part of it. How do we clear the title on that and how do we bring it back into commerce? This is a systems issue and it's, it's one that we are looking at very closely. It might be at coming around the corner on that system that can get us to there, but there is a how. There is a how. Is a how. Mm -hmm. um, I think the implementation of the how is please, because the airship <laughs> issues, I'm, I'm venturing into a legal Oh my God. But airship issues are incredibly personal for people, and so, some, so we do have to be careful about this. But all right, legal expert, talk about it. Yes. Oh, I think you're the one. I don't know if it's an expert part, but I, I do know a little something about this. And so, you know, one of our lessons learned from prior disasters is really the importance of doing air property work, title planning work succession work, probate, whatever you call it, it's really all the same thing. Um, here in Louisiana, we call it different things than other places. And it is work that your local legal aid office used to not do. Um, we really had our aha moment after Katrina and we're like, everybody needs this. Why aren't we doing it for our client community? And um, it was really, had a basis in um, looking at things like, oh, that's an asset, it might involve money, and maybe that's something a private bar should be doing. I wasn't the director then, but um, we really realized that, hey, this is work we have to be doing. You know, mm -hmm. folks cannot afford sometimes even the $15 to get a death certificate, much less $2,500 to hire a private attorney. So we finally change our thinking around that and, and you know we saw a bunch of national data and there's 132 legal aid organizations in the United States and it, from 2006 to like 2008 our one office did 25 percent of all succession slash probate works of all legal aid organizations in the United States and I think because of climate change and prevalence of disasters, it's just become something that all legal aid organizations pretty much in kind of disaster prone areas now realize, hey, we have to do this. So um, the trick is making through community education or um, other novel ways of really getting folks to try to deal with the issue because right now a lot of times even when there is free resources to try to help it's kind of not a problem till it's a problem right till you get hit with that flood or you get hit with that disaster or um you know somebody wants to redevelop stuff in your community and you say yeah i'll sell to you and then you realize you can um so we're we're, we're keeping doing that work as part of our we see that as a big part of resilience work. Um, and then one of our sister organizations, Louisiana Appleseed, they do a lot of legislative reform and policy work. And we work closely with them on 
this title care issues. And one of the things they are looking at, um, they're trying to get traction in the legislature to change the laws that we have around what we call partition, which is basically if you've got those bunches of heirs, or sometimes even if it's two, you might not be able to get agreement. But there's usually that one family member who may still be here who's trying to take care of the house, or trying to do something with the house. And um, they'll get signing because they don't have, you know, a prevailing interest. And so uh, several other states have adopted what's called a, a Uniform Property Partition Act. And so Louisiana is looking at that as a way to try to get a grip and um, be able to do something with properties to enable family members that um, are interested in taking part of property, the ability to kind of control those properties and to prevent other heirs from sort of being able to force them to sell. Um, so it, it's, it covers a lot of different things, um, but I know that that is something that we're kind of looking at um, at the state level. One of the risks of this solution happening with the adjudicated properties is that you know we have these buyers from outside the state mm -hmm. that will just come in, you know, mm -hmm. buy up all these properties, right? And then what we end up doing is displacing a lot of the families that already live there and transforming these, you know traditionally black neighborhoods, thriving neighborhoods, instead of like improving their conditions, improving accessibility for black and brown families to move in, displacing them. And so that that's that's what I fear. Like, you know, this solution happens and very quickly, you know, unless we have a mechanism to have first rider refusal for local residents, you know, like there's gotta be something in place to preserve who gets to buy those properties? Um, we will see that happen because that's happened in New Orleans and in a lot of other places, and, and entire communities are being displaced. And um, uh, priced out of neighborhoods where you know generations of families grew up. Um, I, I wanted to ask Rachel about what do you see your organization? What does your organization see in terms of migration? Uh, where people are moving to because you know Marty used the term we're receiving community and so the implications of that for our future growth and who's moving here and I wonder if you could address that in terms of like the, the shift of population and what we're what we should be expecting in terms of our growth. Mm -hmm. I think it's a reason like we've, we're receiving more people from New Orleans and we're sending for the first time in generations. We should get the train. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, that's uh, spot on, Alfredo. And, and this idea of, of a receiving community, it's a, it's a place, this comes from um, something called LA Safe, Louisiana Strategic Adaptations for Future Environments, which um, I got to work on, Alfredo, I know you got to work on a little bit too, but it's some um, places that are higher and drier where we can think about more dense, more dense development that is safer um, as well. And so when we look at those migration trends, we just kind of look to the past right now because Trying to forecast population migration into the future is really hard. <laughs> um, it's just, it's not something that we um, have necessarily fine tuned. I would actually say like our climate projections are more reliable than our population projections uh, beyond a certain time period, probably like 10, 15, 20 years. They just don't be very reliable. Uh, but what we've seen based on the data and then also the, the anecdotes, like I, again, I think about the people who live in my neighborhood left New Orleans after Katrina um, because they lost everything and they moved to the North Shore. There's stories like that in Baton Rouge and, and everywhere else. I mean, and even post-2016 floods, people moved to my, my neighborhood because of that too. Um, so we know that people are moving to places that they think are higher and drier. Uh, we saw that it, after a lot of storms in the early 2000s and then the floods of 2016 happened and 56 of the 64 parishes in Louisiana had a federally declared disaster because of flooding. A lot of people moved to places that they thought 
they weren't going to have to experience that again. Um, and so, you know, the mental health impacts of that, PTSD, people being really triggered, um, especially, you know, this time of year where, you know, tomorrow is anniversary day for quite a few storms. Um, so people have that on their mind. Um, but yeah, it's just thinking about that, that migration pattern over time and allowing people to have choice and dignity um, as they make those really hard decisions, whether that's, you know, because of personal life choices, because they're, they can't go back to their home, maybe they can't afford it. Um, and so when we're thinking about that population migration, I think again, for us, that ties back to um, policy in a lot of ways. It's, you know, we talked about death, more dense development. So are we actually allowing that where people can live? Um, do we have particular um, ordinances or zoning that is restrictive for multifamily housing? What does that look like? Um, you know, and it's uh, people have a have a squeeze right now for housing and trying to find a place to live. And so it's really tough. And I know a lot of local jurisdictions are trying to figure out how they balance um, a lot of different things like their aging housing stock. That maybe, like you mentioned um, earlier, sir, it needs to flood, but now does. That's a whole different issue that they've got to deal with that they've never dealt with before, on top of trying to accommodate for all these people that are moving there. Um, and I think that the way that <clears throat> we've thought about letting development drive that also relates back to a lot of the work that my organization does, which is around um, transportation. So the way that you actually get subdivisions to happen is you get a permit for that and then they build a road <laughs> and they build a road, they build a road before they build their houses. Um, and so what happens is that becomes something that is, um, it, it's essentially a subsidized cost that the community then takes on where they then, then build single family homes um, that then actually means that, okay, now they need a grocery store, now they need a school, now they need a fire department, all these other things. All right, you see that on um, certainly further down south in the parish here, LA-22, a lot of different um, roads that we built where maybe, you know, people, our ancestors especially knew maybe you shouldn't necessarily live there unless you built your house on stilts, uh, but we started to do that anyways, and that's in part to me and me. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, there's also relocating communities, and they have a lot of really challenging, um, I would say, conversations to think about that are, that are actually happening in the now. So Plaquemines Parish, for example, um, their tax base, that's a Katrina, was demolished. And then they had the oil bust that happened not long after that, and then the Deepwater Horizon spill. And you know, there were a lot of conversations where they couldn't even figure out how to cut their grass. So as you see these declining tax bases, um, and then we start thinking longer term about climate and what that means and what that looks like and who can live there. We have a lot of fisher folk who actually kind of need to live there because it's close to what they do for a living. And then you also meanwhile have the state coming in with something called a sediment inversion, which is an attempt to be able to build land by essentially cutting a hole in the Mississippi River to be able to provide additional marshland buffer to the city of New Orleans, which is also really critical to making sure we don't get a lot of storm surge into Lake Pontchartrain and Morapa. Because fun fact, Baton Rouge is not that far away from having the outskirts of it have its own storm surge in the future. Um, and so it's, it's all interconnected with that same sediment diversion then impacts the fisher folk. So then they have to go out further for their shrimp, right? Which means they need a bigger boat and a bigger refrigeration system. So it's it's all really interconnected. And I think that's um, a long way of me <laughs> coming around about to say uh, climate migration, like we know this better than a lot of folks across the country. Um, our problem is everybody else's problem because a lot of people went to Houston, Biloxi, Jackson, Atlanta, <laughs> all over the place. They just go wherever they know people and where there's jobs at, right? Um, and so our problem is everybody else's problem. And I think people are starting to realize that, especially after Ida last year, um, you know, and the significant rainfall impacts that they had further, further inland. So I don't know if anybody else has anything to add. I just want to give it to Carl. We've, we've talked about density a lot and we've done some high dense and low dense development. What are the challenges of adding more density to the infrastructure factory? I think you, uh, you touched on it. Um, as far as some of the zoning requirements, you have to have this public meeting. Some of the residents may not want this, not in my backyard. Uh, I think that's one of the things And with our development. We, we want to be good neighbors. If, you know, uh, we kind of we talk a little bit from a holistic perspective what we do in Europe, uh, but you do have those challenges where uh, if you're trying to do something innovative, as Alfredo was talking about, 
and uh, the residents are saying, no, I don't want it, I want it happening. And you have to have a zoning change just based on how the zoning uh, ordinances are, are uh, set up. I think that's some of the challenges that we, we come across in some of our, uh, of our developments. And it's not like I said, I think those are great ideas. It's just perspective is reality for people, you know? Uh, so just trying to change that perspective uh, to, to show what you're actually trying to do. What is your one last question for you? Bro. What is your work? Is it is it challenging to put those multi dense developments in high opportunity areas and low opportunity areas, or is the challenge the same for both? I would say both. I think it's it's kind of goes hand in hand. Um, yeah, I would say both. Uh, it's challenging Mark, across yeah. the city. Yeah. Okay. So none of us like. It. <laughs> Can I just put on one? I, my comment was sort of based on that. It, 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 so, in our neighborhood, we live in the Garden District, right? The minimum lot size for the zoning area is bigger than the average lot, which is about 25 by 125. And it's twice the size of that. Um, it's not set up to be able to build, um, like, use or back thing apartment. It's, and, and there's this whole idea of, I think we need to challenge a little bit. You're saying, oh, except somebody doesn't want to duplex by your house. I don't think that's a legitimate it's not me really as an academic saying that but i know people express that the single family veto is a major problem in terms of that i think it needs to be addressed and i want to plug a book a really good one called fixer upper um that just came out there's a recent podcast on that it's a great fun show on that i've been talking about some of these things that i am writing but <laughs> okay but we have we have our architect he, he, we talked about that garden district, how they were doing uh, that same format that you were talking about, Alfredo. And I was like, in order for us to do this, we're going to have to change zoning. We did something not too far from there, and the residents were basically balking at that particular development. So I knew it would be a challenge to go before them. That one there, we didn't have to get zoning changed, so we were fortunate. But this one here, I knew we would have to have zoning changes on there, and I, I, I knew it was going to be a challenge for them. Yeah. Well, I know currently you can build a accessible dwelling unit up to 200 square feet without a permit in the city. And of course, it, it's it's got to be like a studio, not a living. Yes, you know, that's what I was going to say. Not I was a like, living you got space. excited, and I said, no, not a living <laughs> space. But, you know, but it's, it, it's the foundation. Like, you can build on that and then find where, you know, you, you can begin to experiment and, and just create a proof of concept. Because that's what we need. We just need to start doing this and, and develop the concept. Plus, you have this infrastructure bill that's going to, you know, create some opportunities to wind roads, like really address all these reasons why people don't want to do it. People don't want more traffic. You know, they, they don't want more congestion. They don't, they don't want all these things that occur because we don't develop the right infrastructure for more density. And so, if we have all this federal funding, that's that's going to hit our communities, right? And we have this intention of increasing density of areas. Connect these things because the money's there, right? Where it's coming. Yeah, it, it's coming, and and it's for that purpose. Are we considering drainage uh, development from some of these federal funding that are coming? Oh, I mean, probably even much to Alfredo chagrin. We spent an incredible amount of the recent tranche of federal dollars on drainage. Yeah. And drainage infrastructure. So most, on the road. Um, yeah, we, we've had private crews, city crews. It's, it has been a full court drainage press <laughs> that has tons and tons of things have been removed. Projects are on the books. That's that stormwater master plan I mentioned earlier. You're taking cars out of this right? <laughs> I have been told that <laughs> well, yeah, the <laughs> no cars. I, I even I'm <laughs> fast, but we have we have pulled some. Some surprising items out of our <laughs> house This seems to be a nasty question. But not oh. <laughs> so I keep reading in the newspaper. We're spending forty million dollars to clean ditches and stormwater. My first thought is, I thought we were already paying taxes to have this done. Exactly. How did it get there so badly? Yeah. Why haven't we been cleaning it out? All along. So that's that's one question. I have a question. The next question is after we spend the 40 million, what are we, how are we going to keep it clean then? That's such a good answer to this question. No, I don't know. Probably about 
two months ago, I would have had to sit here and kind of. Um, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, no, so l let me reframe it, right? So in Florida, right, we, they have, they do clean drains on a regular basis because they have a specific fee that they levy to do that work. In the city of Baton Rouge, we had no specific fee to cover that. We had about a six man crew, which is really embarrassing if you can say in two trucks to do it. And so as we continue to expand, this is where things come full circle to meet the growing housing needs of our city, but none of us wanted to live in dense areas and share a drain. We all wanted new drains. Um, we did not grow that capacity or that funding to meet that need. So we are looking at passing um, a, a specific, you know, that comes with your water bill to pay for specific services around this so that now that we have clean some of the slate and some of the ways we will have funds to keep that work up. And that is the result of not just work with City Parish, but work of, of community activists who've really pushed us and pushed the community to accept that as, as a solution to a shared problem. Is that not being corrupted once you put it into the hands of the private utility? I mean, come on. I, uh, really? I mean, I, 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 there's, I, I can't necessarily, but I, I can say that the, the fees in other communities have been really helpful. And the, the fees will, of course, they're not going to be collected by energy, but will come to the city and the Department of Public Works to do, to expand their crews, to expand their, their vehicles. And if, yeah. if, if, if their spending down of our federal tranche is any indication, it will be used, it will use to create incredible work, incredible Or you go to pay for somebody at the border company's vacation home. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's the crux of the issue right there, is when you put the money into the hands of the corrupt people who aren't going to have to pay or to account for what happened to the money. And this has been going on a long time. That's why, like you said, we, do, we did pass taxes for that drainage. And you still see, even, and this is previous administrations, I love the Burma administration and the progress is finally being made. But we ride bicycles on the campus area, and we see firsthand those drains are plugged up to yeah. the grave. And we're being taxed for that already. It's, yeah, it's, the, we don't have, we currently do not have a dedicated source of funds for that. But I think you are right, the drains are not where they need to be. And that, that's the, been a clear priority of, of the city. So, so we're now hoping the Biden administration passes our money for the solutions, and now we're talking to, uh, already about putting it in the hands of corruption of the private. I, I can only speak. I mean, so it's not going to be the private utilities. So the same how uh, trash and everything is just collected enough that's the way to do the collection, but it will be given to the city government to do the work. That they do. It's not. But I, so, I mean, we are talking about housing, though. I do need to bring us back to housing solutions. <laughs> Sorry. Go watch ahead. the money, though. I mean, it's important. Watch the money. Because yeah, you know, if, if you all don't show up at those council meetings and you continue to let your council members just like, sure, you know, without questioning it, yeah. it's just going to keep happening. Without networking, we're not going to have anybody to come in and say, in, in, in mass enough to say, we saw what you did. And we're here to say that these people that are supposed to be prosecuting you since corruption aren't doing it. And we're going to hold your feet to the fire. We just like we're walking around blind as, as a community to this corruption. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just, go ahead. But I, I would say a lot of jurisdictions do it just the water fees, which maybe we might yes. put that under the umbrella of, and they're administered with more or less success. Mm -hmm. But I yes. mean, to the extent that we have any, you know, taxes, I think. Those that we have to have some minimum uh, trust in our government, you know, and give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, trust the that, was, well, that was what I was going to say to you. I wanted to ask y'all because so much of this, we are getting very technocratic in these conversations. We know what the mechanisms are to change these things. What I gather, I don't think there's a matter of like knowing how to do it. This is cultural. So even yeah. things like believing when you buy, when you pay your taxes, that it will be used to do the things, that that's a culture. We have a deep cultural belief that our taxes will be wasted. We have a deep cultural belief that it's my property, I can do what I want. It's a moral wrong to take someone's house, even if it's been there for 10 years and it's a, a hellhole and somebody could be you know, to fix it. No, that's a deep cultural thing, right? 
or um, even like the blight, we were talking about the stuff in the storm drains. We, until you move away and come back, you don't realize like this place has a littering thing that is not normal. People just throw stuff. That is cultural. Like that is some deep. So I guess that's my kind of question for y'all. Like I think we all know, like not everybody is really smart. And we actually know there's playbooks for this stuff and there's pattern books. And there's like, how do we change the culture? to be a place that supports these things that says people need safe housing and they have a right to that and yeah. we should do these things because they're moral goods. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's To me, that's the thing that I'm stuck on. Right. Like, I just want to touch on this isn't a housing answer, but Marie Constantine has done an amazing job, I think, of changing the culture concept that stuff runs stuff in the river. Mm -hmm. And I know she's been working on it for a long time. Yeah, like but it's been come to people's consciousness mm -hmm just in the past two or three years. And it's, so it's, uh, how do we do it? We, we pick your pick your issue and be the voice. And, and you know, she can't do it from the mayor's office. We've no. got to do it from here. So pick your issue and get a, get a bullhorn and, and. She can pass uh, street sweepers, but in but 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 but, yeah. but she can't keep sweeping up. If, if if we could stop people from throwing their crap on the ground, she wouldn't need some sweepers. Yeah, we're all mixed up. You can do this though, and I was with you know Marie and Constantine and I had coffee many a days before she had an interaction, and. The garbage trucks in Florida did a huge study of it. So garbage trucks who don't pull that little net back over the garbage. Uh, this is uh, not rocket time. <laughs> <laughs> so they can't fly onto the interstate. And then we have a rain event. And the, all the trash goes down the storm drains into Capitol Lakes and into the Burden Center. The city can do something about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. care about where you live. Yeah, I, I think I think you're right though. You're onto something here because there is something you can do. Because residents sometimes just don't know that they shouldn't take that styrofoam, you know, cooler and just dump it on the corner, which I saw my neighbor do two days ago, and I was like, that's the thing that's okay to do, you know. But it's like there, there's no instruction. There's nothing on that bill, that utility bill, that says don't throw these things out. There really isn't. And, and even like when I got a new garbage bin, it doesn't come with any literature that educates somebody about what not to put in there, what not to put in the curb. And maybe if it does, it's once, but it needs to be more repeatable. Money. We have so, to pay a little bit in taxes to get that printed. And this, is, <laughs> this is connected to housing because this is yeah. how blight starts. You know, like yes. If blight starts this way and it builds and builds, and suddenly the whole block looks blighted. People's ability to build wells in their house, mm -hmm. which which is have a long term impact on all of the issues we talked about today. I do. Um, go ahead. One Sorry. last question. Yeah. So maybe I ask a question to Mr. Uh, Dillon. It, it connected to I know that within the drainage work that's being done, say there's this consideration of making some changes to the uniform development code in terms of zoning, subdivision, roads, drainage, like all of those are in kind of one part of our. Our, our, our code, and um, I was sort of wondering if you as a developer are the barriers to you to create more supply. You see, you said that they're sort of similar and richer and poor areas, and do you think there are small things that need to be tweaked in that code to make it cheaper and easier for you to build housing, or do you think that sort of that redevelopment code for infill, the kind of work that you do needs to be sort of rewritten I, I think it's based on the density. I think there's certain, based on whatever that zoning is, you can put um, so many units per acre, uh, and they kind of eliminate some of those things. And if you want to change that, then it has to go before a planning commission. There's a public hearing. Uh, residents are going to come out and, and speak on that. If that's something that's changed, where you can kind of eliminate the, that barrier and uh, you can develop it a little bit more dense in those areas, and you yeah. can have the affordable housing we're talking about. So more of a variety, because yeah. it's expensive for you, I suppose. Well, one expensive, uh, two is a process. It, it could be a lengthy process to do that. And three, like I said, us as a nonprofit, we're, we're trying to be good neighbors, 
So we're starting off on the wrong foot with this kind of like a war, like us against them type of uh, uh, relationship as opposed to us coming to collectively to say, this is what we're trying to do for your community. We're trying to enhance it. But like I said, it's perception is reality in these situations where, uh, you know, you, you kind of tell someone this, but they're not, they're not going to understand. Because they have their own fixed way of doing things. This is what they want. And it doesn't matter how you, you word that or come about it. It's, it's, it's just a mindset. It's culture, like, like the lady said. It's a culture. Something not in the room is habitat. And they do redevelopment. Yeah. And I think habitat has a proven model that works well, both in like increasing of ownership, but also in you know redeveloping and turning like a whole walk around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because once they they start redeveloping blighted properties, they also provide support for anybody else that wants to paint their house or fix it. You know, mm -hmm. and then the whole block gets better. And once the block gets better, the neighborhood starts to really turn. You know, I've heard them talk about that 180 approach that, that really shifts neighborhoods. And, you know, I just wonder if, if, if it isn't worthwhile to invest in that approach and invest in more of that because um, they're doing redevelopment, but they're also a lender. You know, they're, they're also a financer. <clears throat> so they have, like, all the components you really need to help people uh, become homeowners and then help entire neighborhoods. You know, you talk about the low-hanging fruit, right? The, the fake-in adjudicated properties that, you know, we're going to have a solution. And we really need uh, local people to be able to buy those properties. And, you know, with a partnership with, with like, folks like Habitat that have that model, uh, I think we can see some progress. I mean, Habitat, UREC, Mid-City Redevelopment, they are all doing that community block model for revitalization. They're, they're trying to stack improvements next to each other, rehab to cross from it, yep. and then wraps community development services, whether that's everything from murals to, like, to, to financial literacy, to home ownership and renters, and, right? So, so that's that area of focus. And, and I, I know y'all you know, do a lot of that work too. Um, but I think even that, right? So Habitat, that's all single family. And so some of, that, some of that's a little bit easier for them. Um, we can talk about the financing for that, right? Because you mentioned, I think the biggest difference is that Habitat, they're a CDFI. Yep. They can lend to individuals to do this. So they are not working through the traditional financial system. They have their, they have a guerrilla parallel financial system <laughs> that they're leveraging because they're a national organization that can help them to do this work. Yep. I can speak on financing for community development. You can speak on financing for community development. But just to pass back to you, what does that capital stack look like what does it need to look like to meet our housing needs? We've been talking about resiliency, but we have a stock issue, too. We need more units on the streets. So it's called affordable housing, but a two by four is a two by four. You know, you're going to pay $14 for it, regardless if it's on one side of town or the other side of town. So, like she's saying, it is a capital stack that needs to take place because uh, it's the same uh, housing may appraise differently, but it's the same cost to construct their home. So. The stack is there's federal funds through HUD that is passed down to the city uh, as well as to the state finance agencies. And we uh, submit for applications for those funds and uh, we layer that with traditional uh, financing. So that's where that stack uh, comes into play. Some of those federal funds from the government, there's other uh, institutions that provide funding for that federal home loan bank. Uh, you have some people on those larger scales, they're using lower income housing tax credits, uh, opportunity zones, uh, different things like that, and then layering that with traditional uh, financing, which is very uh, favorable to your local uh, lenders and the fact that they're typically looking for maybe an 80-20 uh, loan to value ratio, and when you're adding in some of these federal funds, they may be coming in 60, 50 percent loan to value, so it's very favorable for them, and they're also able to uh, fulfill their CRA requirements uh, as well. CRA being? Uh, I always get that for them. Community Reinvestment Act. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, Community Reinvestment Act. In the wake of some financial uh, 
uh, this app. Banks now have to invest in the communities that they do business in. So the more business a bank does in an area, the more CRA credit, CRA credits they need. They get CRA credits by granting dollars to community efforts or by funding affordable housing development. So it's, it's a model for how to strong our banks to be partners in the work. But I will say one more thing too that that stack is not just the development side, but even on the home ownership side too. There's a, there's a stack as well. When I talk about just some of the challenges that we have with affordable housing, is that you are trying to qualify a potential person to purchase a home, and their credit score has to get to a certain point, and then uh, making it affordable for them as well. And that comes in there's subsidy programs that the city offers at, at one point in time, as well as the state agencies. Where they can buy down on that home. So let's say hypothetically a home is a hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, the state or the uh, city may have a subsidy program that they can qualify for up to twenty twenty five thousand dollars. So it kind of reduces their monthly uh, mortgage that they're paying uh, for as well. So we look at it from a capital stack, not just for the development side, but also for the homeowner as well. So I think we're at time, correct? Yes, or over. I won't be. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, but, Mr. Dillon, he makes a good point. So I've been affiliated with the Housing Authority for 10 years. Okay. It costs the same amount per square foot to build something that's affordable than something that upper middle class can handle. HUD takes too bad gum wrong to be right. almost anything. Right. And the problem is, right now we have a system where we have monies, for instance, to develop affordable housing. But then the people that develop it, and you were at that same workshop and you were on that panel, they develop it, they take their money and go. The profit margin on renting out multifamily units that are affordable and safe and healthy at $7.29 an hour. And I tell you, we have a lot of women in public housing that are making seven dollars to twenty thousand an hour. Lobbyists would have you believe it's only teenagers. No, it's not. And so that's we have a lot of things in Louisiana that we're making ourselves have to work harder to figure out how to solve them when it's like low hanging fruit out there. And I don't know. Who's doing the lobbying to convince people? It's on the key measures. It's not. It's and literally $10. Lobbying is literally doing a lobbying. <laughs> <laughs> $10 and $12 right. is not. You know, a new housing report came out. You all probably read that. $17.26 yeah. an hour is what you have to make mm -hmm. in Baton Rouge to rent a moderate two bedroom apartment. To be able to afford it. Right. Yes, yes, you're a good point. So there are, you know, it's like we all care and we all need to figure out where we're going to, where we can go first and take the, again, the low hanging fruit and then get some some movement. Sam. I'm getting old. You guys got to <laughs> I know it'll be every my generation's problem. Um, you know, almost half of Baton Rouge residents are housing cost burden. I will add that for renters, that is as true in South Baton Rouge as it is in North Baton Rouge. So this is everyone's problems. Um, the issue we issues we've talked about today, North Baton Rouge is more climate resilient than part of South Baton Rouge. So, and the single family home issue, <laughs> this is true in North Baton Rouge. So th this is our problem. And we have to have a solution for it. So, Jason said it, kick me off. <laughs> um, but so, the last thing I'll say is uh, you know, the mayor's office's job really is to uplift the community solutions. So, the last question I have is, is what is your solution to all of this? And give it to me in 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. So, once again, um, we have thousands of adjudicated vacant properties. Okay. That's a start. We need to make sure local people can buy them, not outside investors. That would just transform in that way neighborhoods. And um, I want to say one thing about the stack. The 
it's necessary because CRA investments from banks, those institutions are also necessary, but we need an anchor institution strategy so that universities and hospitals that have already identified housing as one of the um, health indicators, you know, indicators of health. Every hospital in this city has indicated housing the health indicator. Invest in housing. So if we have vacant properties, uh, sort of like, you know, thousands of those that we can use, make sure local people can buy them and get those investors on board, I think we can do this. So 30 seconds or less, um, I'll just talk about what I know, and that is that the work that we do at the Legal Aid Office is has part of the solution of what we're talking about, you know, especially when you're talking about lower income communities um, and other vulnerable communities. You know, what is that piece? We're talking about homeowners. Um, a lot of times it is the air property issues. If we're talking about um, trying to prevent blight, a lot of times we'll find um, that someone will reach out to us and they may be facing a potential foreclosure and then we do the work to try to get them back in good standing. And so when you, when you start taking a deep dive into communities, uh, you're going to uncover a lot of different things that are going on and um, we stand ready to assist as long as we can. <laughs> Uh, and, and for my 30 seconds, I'll say, I think it's just a collective approach. I think the, the people that you have at this table and then there's some others that, that are key uh, to this. Of course, you already can do this uh, by themselves. The mayor's office or no one here can do that uh, just by themselves. I think it's a collective approach and bringing the right people to the table to uh, come up with that, that solution. So I think we're actually going to go back to that the question about culture. Um, and I, I think for me, it has to do with getting folks into elected and appointed positions who operate uh, in different moral and philosophical frameworks than that of Western culture and rugged individualism. Like I think, um, you know, it's one thing to say when you know better, you do better, but that only means that you're working from a philosophical framework. That means that you will act good on that, right? Um, so I think it's really more about shifting folks that are in the, that position, in those positions into more Eastern philosophical frameworks for morality. So, you know, the concept of I exist because you exist, um, really thinking more community level and community based um, and having people who are ready to make policy decisions based on that, because I don't think any of our solutions are going to work unless we actually have the policy structures in place to support them. So, um, yeah, getting folks into office and appointed positions who are in that I exist because you exist mindset is, is my solution. Um, all right, well, on behalf of Mayor President Brim, I want to thank everybody for joining us here in this discussion. Um, I did want to uh, let Jennifer speak a little bit about this, uh, the, the photos that have been rotating. Do you want to stand up right now? Yeah, I just, uh, so when we talked about this, we thought, well, well, this is an art place. How can we bring some visual into the room? Um, and so we looked at, uh, we took one random week, and I went and took photos of, uh, of all the houses or apartments where someone has been evicted in, in that week. Um, and it was amazing to me to go around town. I thought for sure I'd be totally in Gardier and totally in North Baton Rouge. That was not at all the experience. Um, so it was fascinating to me. Like three three people in this particular week were evicted from this very lovely looking up. I didn't actually drive all the way up to Fort Hudson to take that photo off the website. But, you know, uh, it, it wasn't what I expected. So uh, my takeaway from that is People like like Marley said, it's not just the North Baton Rouge thing. People all over are having trouble. The second part is of uh, the pictures that have a red background. I went to one particular block area, and that's where I know that Habitat is working out the neighborhood concept. And I just drove up and down these streets. In this five block area, there were almost 30 vacant lots, half of which are not even being mowed properly. Like one of the guys, as I drove up to take the photo, was like, have to do something about this shit, would you? And I was like, I'm doing my best. And I was like, so um, so when we're talking about space and is there enough land, 
there in that one you know five block area there were 30 lots that we could develop on if title was clear and people would do it and whoever would buy it and whoever would sell it so it's going to take uh so those are my two takeaways uh and it was fascinating to go taking these photos because it got me into areas thinking about things um that, that we all need to be thinking about all right, well, thank you so much. And um, I really appreciate you spending your Sunday on our passion projects. <laughs> and I hope you wish us all uh, the best of luck. And we wish you all the best of luck in joining us and being a part of the solution. Stay engaged. Stay engaged, yeah.